That song sends, honestly gives me chills as, as we sing it. Oh my gosh, I love that song. Um, good morning, everybody. Like I said, my name is Riley Pickrell, um, and I'm honored uh, to be able to get to preach God's word to you this morning, um, especially uh, on today, because as you guys know, school's back in session. I'm in campus ministry. It's a busy time of the year. Thank you, my friend. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> And, um, and, and it excites me, thinking about the students all coming back to the valley. And uh, if you don't know this, the Lehigh Valley, um, as students come back in the fall, uh, sees an increase of 40,000 students uh, that are going back to school. Between 10 schools across the whole valley, we have 40,000. They're all small schools with less than 6,000, but the no actual number of students is, is quite remarkable. It's, it's huge. And, uh, and thinking about this, uh, me getting to be someone who spends most of my time with college students, um, it excites me. I think about the students moving back for the first time and beginning a new chapter in life. Uh, I loved my time when I was in college. If you don't know, I went to the University of Cincinnati, Bearcats. Um, I love them. And uh, uh, also from Cincinnati. But anyway, uh, I love thinking about uh, what God is going to do when people start this new chapter in their life and when they go off to school to, uh, to learn something or learn a trade. Uh, to, uh, basically to uh, find what they want to do in life. Uh, they learn a lot. And, uh, and I love this age also because I love thinking about how, how God is kind of like a great maestro uh, in the background uh, orchestrating the times and places that really he's going to allow people to come and to seek him. Um, if you don't know, I became a Christian when I was in college uh, through the help of, of great friends and people that met me, that showed me God's word. Um, it's, so it's a very near and dear time of life uh, to me anyway. And, and I love thinking about how God is that great person in the background, making every moment and providing the opportunities that every single person in the world would come and, and know him. By. And, and today we're actually going to go to the book of Acts. Kurt has given me the authority to choose whatever I wanted to preach on this morning. So be careful. It's going to, but very excited for that. But anyway, we're going to go to Acts uh, 17 if you want to be going over there. And um, if you ever do want inspiration, um, feeling down in your faith, read the book of Acts. Um, the story of the early church, where it was started and who started it um, is, is quite inspiring in every way. But before we, we dive too far uh, let's go to God and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, thank you for uh, this morning that we can come and, and worship you. And, and God, I love thinking about the words of Wade in the water and how you're going to trouble it. That God, uh, when it comes to anything worthwhile happening in this life, anything of great value, God, you're the one behind it. Uh, you move it. You make the water troubled. You, uh, God, you, you prepare hearts. Uh, you get us ready to meet you in the most grand ways um, and to learn about, Lord, how amazing you are, how wide your love is, how deep it is, uh, and just what you're willing to do to get back in a relationship with us. And I pray, God, as we go to your word and look at your early church, God, I pray we can all walk away inspired, um, that we can uh, look, about, look at this week and uh, maybe even sign up for a Rush Week event, um, but also just feel inspired that, wow, God can do something with just a few words or a conversation that I have with somebody. And you can change a life. And God, so I pray, uh, Lord, speak to us. Say uh, what you want said, Lord. And, uh, and I pray that God, as we all walk away from your word, you can inspire us. God, we love you. We ask all this in your son's name. Amen. And to give a little context of what we're going to be reading here in chapter 17 is uh, we're going to jump in and zoom in on Paul. Um, Paul is, uh, was a very uh, prominent figure in the first century church. If you don't know, he wrote most of the New Testament. Uh, so, uh, you know, major uh, uh, flex from Paul. Uh, but anyway, we're jumping in on what's called his second missionary journey, which was a time in history where him and, and some other disciples really went out and, and they went and planted churches and they would go places where the gospel, the message of Jesus, this Messiah who was promised to always come, uh, is here. And, and it's, it's different than what we ever really ever expected. And, and they went and, and showed people scriptures and, and basically started a movement that would uh, lead here to us today, 2,000 years later, that we're still reading the writings of Paul and still talking about these journeys. Um, 
And in Acts 17, verse 1, uh, it reads, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue there. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, because even in this first verse, there's actually a little bit to unpack here. It might seem like it's just kind of telling us where he went, uh, but there's some important things in here. The very fact that Paul could have traveled from Amphipolis and then Apollonia and then Thessalonica, which are all kind of like a day's journey from each other, like they're, they're pretty close. The very fact that he could have reached these three cities with the speed he did and then get to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue, actually took about 600 years of history. Um, history um, and uh, world leaders and uh, kingdoms uh, working and, and doing things and, and it all led really to the possibility that Paul could have even done this. And we're going to talk more about that. And I'm sorry anyone who just heard the word history and their eyes glazed over, but today uh, we're going to have kind of a history lesson. So class is in session. Um, get ready. Um, uh, but this, <laughs> but, it's, but let's keep going. At verse 2, it says, as was Paul's custom, uh, he went into the synagogue and for three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. The Jesus I'm proclaiming to you, the Messiah, he said, uh, is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and Jews. And, and let's stop there. So as Paul was going, his custom was to stop in each synagogue. Um, why is that? Um, because in the synagogue, what you're going to find is you're going to find a bunch of Jews who love God's word. You're going to find a Hebrew Bible, whether completed or not completed. Um, and not only that, you would find then what was called God fears. We read this word here, uh, God fearing Greeks. Them being in there in these synagogues at this very moment in history was also no accident. Um, what they were were basically uh, non Jewish people who, you know, kind of uh, were looking in the window of the synagogue saying, like, hey, what are these Jews in here reading? Uh, this looks kind of sweet, actually. What is this? Um, we want some of this. Um, this is pretty cool. As they read the scriptures and learned about, wow, the God of the Hebrew Bible is actually much different than the one that we understand or any of the religions or, uh, or the laws that we actually know in our day. So there is synagogues that would have been full of Greeks and Jews all loving the word of God, perfectly placed on a road that Paul was able to go down. And as he was going to them, what it says in verse 3, explaining and proving the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Um, that would have been a part that they would have maybe been like, Oh, he had to rise from the dead. What does that mean, the Messiah had to do that? He's the Messiah. Why would he have to rise? Because the message was that the one who had to come, he didn't just have to rise. It was mandatory that Jesus, to be the, the offering, to be the one that would take our place for us to have, you know, the relationship with God that we can have, these things had to happen. He had to rise from the dead. Um, and for us to know even just the extent of God's love, it, get, it gets to be shown through Jesus, that God, what, where, how far is God willing to go? He would die for us, just so that we would know who he is. And like I said, these, these conditions, it took many years, and we're actually, uh, we're going to dive into the history lesson. So actually, for the next few minutes, bear with me as we kind of look into this. But, and, and also, at this time, I also think it, it um, should be said, um, and I have, should have a slide of Galatians 4. Uh, Galatians 4 would have probably been written around the time Paul was in this region. So as he traveled down this road through Anthopolis and Apollonia and Thessalonica, um, this would have been the time he would have probably written about Galatia because he was just in Galatia, if you read any of Acts before this. But in Galatians 4, what he says is, But when the time, or the set time, had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And when he, when he wrote this, that time had fully come, our English Bibles, that's what it's kind of rendered out as, but it would have meant something more like overflowing fullness, that the time had come was actually perfect, like a perfect storm for the gospel to then go and be preached. And he had been writing this not too long after he was actually 
in these cities as we read in Acts 17. But all these conditions, like, I was, like I'm saying, uh, it actually started to be formed 600 years before these events. Um, and it all kind of started with a dream that a guy had. And the dream wa was had by a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. And I never know when to drink my water, so I'm gonna drink it now. <laughs> and anyway, uh, you could be turning over there, if you would like to, to Daniel 2, verse 36. But I'm gonna give a little bit of background because we're not gonna read the whole thing. But what happened is this king, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. Uh, he ruled in around in the seventh century-ish, uh, around the late you know, six twenties, something like that. And anyway, he has a dream, and what he saw in the dream was a giant statue. Now, I should have a slide behind me as well. And the statue had a head of gold. It had a chest and arms of silver, like myself. It had a belly and thighs of bronze, and then legs of iron and partly baked clay. And he had this vision, and then he wanted to know kind of what it meant. It frightened him. Uh, so he gets together all of his wise men, um, who are, the technical word would have been magi, um, and he gets them together and says, guys, I need to know what this means, um, but I'm not going to tell you what it means. Um, so I'm not actually going to explain it. I want you to tell me what the dream is and then interpret it for me. And which kind of makes sense because like if he told them a dream, they could have just made up anything. They could have been like, the head of gold is, uh, it's going to be your wealth and it's, it's going to grow uh, all throughout the years. And you know, the thighs of bronze are, uh, represent you because you never skip leg day. Um, <laughs> like it, who knows. Um, but anyway, he wants them to in, tell him the dream and then after that interpret it. And they say, we can't do that. That's impossible. Nobody can do that steps in Daniel, uh, who's the book's named after. Daniel steps in and says, I can do that. Well, not me, but the God who's the God in heaven can interpret this dream for you. So he goes in, he tells the, the king the dream, he tells him all about the statue and all the different parts. Uh, and you can kind of imagine, like I love thinking about this scene, like you can imagine Daniel is like, is, am I right? Um, am I on the right track? Um, because literally, his life is on the line. Nebuchadnezzar said to his magi that if you can't interpret it, uh, I'm going to kill you and your family and destroy everything that you have. Um, true story. Uh, it's pretty crazy. But anyway, uh, he, he tells him the dream, and then he knows it. And we're going to pick up in verse 36, where then Daniel is going in to explain the dream to the king. And he says, this was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. Um, he tells them that, that King Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, is it's the head of gold of this statue. As you, another, or after you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours. And then next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule the whole earth. And finally, there's going to be a fourth kingdom. Strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and the iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron, even as you saw the iron mixed with clay. And as the toes were iron and partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly uh, brittle and partly strong. And just as you saw the iron mixed with clay, so the people will be a mixture and not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it itself will remain forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out from the mountain, not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold to pieces. Uh, one part of the um, actual dream I didn't mention was besides the statue, there was a rock that was cut out, and one not of human hands. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true. The interpretation is trustworthy. Okay. So this is kind of amazing. Even thinking about this uh, verse um, in the book of Daniel, which these things were happening in the 7th century BC. 
And what happened in this dream is, is Daniel is in, not just interpreting, but predicting the future of these kingdoms that are going to come and the times and places that this rock that was cut out not by human hands, a rock only God could have set up, when that would actually come. And if you read later into Daniel, we're not going to keep going, uh, he, he actually names the the, the nations. He says Babylon is the first one. Uh, he says the next one is going to be Persia, and then Greece he names by name uh, throughout the rest. So I'm just saying, it's, the Word of God's kind of crazy. Uh, how, and, and we know that these things weren't written after Jesus because uh, something called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Research it. It's very cool, very interesting. Uh, but this amazing predictable value here. But we're, I'm going to walk through. This is the, the history part. Um, so please bear with me in this. I'm going to try to keep it interesting. Um, the first kingdom that he talks about, he talks about Babylon. You are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, what, and all these things, and again, we've got to think about this in the context of Acts 17, the perfect conditions just right for the gospel and you know, God's letter of love to be released to all the world was going to be during the time when Paul was going around. The perfect conditions. So, what does Babylon have to do with that? Why, why Babylon? Why is, why is he needed? Um, Babylon, because Israel in the 7th century was taking God for a ride on the struggle bus. It was not in a good place. Uh, it was going after foreign gods, uh, the people. Uh, like it says in Deuteronomy 1, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully all of his commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations and all will go well for you. If not though, if you lose your first love, if you do not follow the word, then things will not go well for you. You're going to get conquered. The people will not be healthy. There will not be unity. And so the people were in a place where that wasn't them. They, they left their first love and uh, they didn't complete all that God really had in store for them. Um, so why did Babylon need to come in? Because God needed to get his people back in love with the word that he spoke to them. Um, because what happened in Babylon is the people were away from the sacrificial system. They're away from all these outward distractions. Uh, so in Babylon, the people, all they had was their scrolls. So they fell back in love with God's word. Um, they looked into it. They, they started to learn it again and not only just learn it, but then start applying it to their lives and using it in every single way. And the synagogue system was first developed in Babylon. And if you want to know what, you know, we read about the Pharisees in the New Testament, they started in Babylon. They are actually a really dope group. They get a bad rap in the New Testament because obviously there's um, some legalism there. But uh, they started here in Babylon. Um, and their goal was basically just to teach people the word of God. Um, pretty amazing. Um, so you get these synagogues that are sprouting up all over Babylon. At this time, they would have been full of Jews. Uh, they've been learning centers where Jews were eagerly learning the word of God. And as we kind of learn in, in Nehemiah, uh, we see this. We see as they return back uh, to the land that they're a whole different people. Uh, and that they actually, the first thing they do is they have a reading of the law for everybody. Um, the people have changed at that point. Uh, so the, the point of it, and there should be a slide going behind me uh, that should show a little arrow pointing from Israel to Babylon. Uh, but the people were taken over there to Babylon. Thanks. And, um, and that was the reason. They need to fall back in love with God's word. So now you have a bunch of synagogues filled with a bunch of Jews who love the word of God again. Uh, but it's all in Babylon. So what happens next, the second kingdom is Persia. The, the next part of the statue is going to be the arms of silver and the chest of silver. Um, they come in. And, and why, why is Persia important? Um, because through a shift of power, there was no war. It was more of a political thing. Um, Cyrus of Persia, um, who is named by Daniel, comes in and becomes basically now the ruler of Babylon and everything. Um, Cyrus takes over the world. When we Actually, in Nehemiah that we just went through our sermon series over Nehemiah, uh, Cyrus is the guy who sends the, the Jews back to Jerusalem. Um, but not only that, he also sent everyone everywhere. He was a much more lenient ruler. Um, they didn't just have to go back to Jerusalem. They could go wherever they wanted. So what we get in history, um, and this happened around the beginning of the 500s, uh, we get what's called the Great Dispersion, the Diaspora. Um, it's when all the people that were now in the, in the area of Babylon were said, okay, you can go. You don't have to stay here. And they went all over the world. So now what we have is 
synagogues full of Jews loving God's word being dispersed everywhere. Uh, not just Jerusalem, but they went north, south, east, and all over, really, the Mediterranean basin. You have all these synagogues full of people with the Bible, with the word of God. Um, but at the time, it was kind of a closed system. There also should be a slide that um, shows behind me with the dispersion of synagogues. Um, <laughs> right? And anyway, um, now you have them everywhere. Uh, so, what happens next? Um, then we get this guy, um, and there's, there's next, another slide of a dude. Um, his name is Alexander the Great. The next kingdom that comes up, one of bronze, uh, which if you know history a little bit, bronze was the kind of metal that was honed and used by the Greeks. So the next kingdom to come in is Greece. And Alexander the Great, and this is the coolest one to me. This one blows me away. Alexander the Great was a student of Aristotle. Um, and he loved Greek culture, and something in Greek culture that was very prominent um, is that they had a love for learning. Um, so one of the first things he does when he comes to power, takes over the world, um, is he assembles his, his scholars in a team, then, um, and then collects writings from all of the nations, not just Greek, but Persian, Hebrew, Babylonian, um, really any kind of uh, nation or group that would have been there. He brings all of their writings and their combined wisdom and has it all translated to Greek. Um, so now, at this time, uh, really Greek was kind of like the, uh, the English is today. It was the business language. Everybody spoke Greek. Um, up to this point, the synagogues were a relatively closed system. If you didn't know Hebrew and you weren't a Jew, you probably weren't getting much out of it. Um, you know, if I was going to talk to you in, in Russian and you don't know Russian, it's going to be a very one-sided conversation. So anyway, uh, everyone is now speaking Greek. And now in every synagogue all over the Mediterranean basin, you have a Hebrew Bible that's not only in Hebrew, but in Greek being read. Um, the Greek translation at this time is it's called the Septuagint. Uh, it's very famous. And, and so now you have this word of God everywhere, and everybody's speaking the same language. So what happens, and this is where we get the God-fearers um, that we read about in Acts 17. Why are they coming? Because at this time, uh, you get everybody reading the word of God. And when you compare it to any other legal system of the day, any other religion, uh, and you see the word of God's social justice, its fairness, the beauty of it, and the beauty of just a loving God who, who just wants to know his people um, and is willing really to do anything and his patience is almost never ending. When you compare that to anything else of the day, it's like, it's, nothing, it's, it's not even comparable. So what happened is now you get all these people saying, we want in on this. This God, this here, this makes sense. This is a God that I would follow. And now you have these synagogues all over the world, not only with Jews, but now with these God-fearers. Um, who now, and they all love the word of God, and now they're all waiting for what the Hebrew Bible, what the Old Testament, had always set up, which was a Messiah. <laughs> the Hebrew Bible actually ends on a cliffhanger, if you've, uh, if you've uh, ever heard that before. Um, but it's, they're all waiting for the Messiah now, and they're everywhere. So, the fourth kingdom, what needed to happen next is, and our next kingdom, the one, the iron that crushes everything, Rome was the next one to come up. And, and what happened is basically Caesar Augustus, who's kind of one of the most prominent uh, Roman uh, Caesars really to ever live, he enacts, uh, and this is the next kingdom about a hundred years after uh, Alexander, what's called Pax Romana. Uh, Pax Romana just means peace of Rome. It means that they weren't going to enter any foreign engagements or try to take any new lands. They've, they already had everything, so you know, let's just focus on in-house things. Um, so what happened is they had a military full of people who weren't really being used, so they focused on infrastructure. So in Pax Romana, they were building roads, they were clearing the seas of pirates, um, they were uh, making travel actually possible because at this time, uh, which is actually very interesting to me, it's basically like the Wild West in the Mediterranean Basin. Like, if you left for somewhere, you didn't know if you were going to make it. You know, you might just get beat up on the road. Um, but anyway, he goes in, he cleans uh, the seas, he, he clears the roads, he builds roads everywhere. There should be another slide that does pop up behind me of now all of the synagogues everywhere full of Greek-speaking uh, Jews and, and Greeks, of course, uh, and Romans 
Now there's roads connecting every single one. Honestly, when I think about this, it just blows me away. Like, what in the world? All these things happen. So now you get all these perfect conditions, and it's under, like in the vision, it says uh, it's under these kings, the one, the kingdom of iron. Under, in these conditions, God's going to set up his kingdom that will never end, that will always endure. And it's this one that we then see Jesus come on the scene. During the time of Rome, when, when there was peace and you could travel, uh, relatively peace, uh, and there was Greek-speaking Jews and Romans and, and Greeks in synagogues everywhere that you could travel to, that's when God said, this is the right time, that my son's going to be sent, that this, you know, the most amazing display of love really and ever <laughs> um, in human history, that's when I'm going to reveal this to the world in my son, Jesus. And this is what we get, man. Now, when we read in Acts 17 that Paul walked into Thessalonica and for three days was able to teach, that didn't happen by accident. This was set up from the beginning. God had a, a plan that, that there was going to be a time that he was going to send his son and it was going to be the perfect time, overflowing fullness to send him. Rome was the time. And it shows all of this, and, and honestly, just thinking about it, it does really just amaze me. Um, it shows us that God has a set plan that to accomplish his desire uh, from the moment that really he began life, um, he had one desire, and it was for Jew and Gentiles. It was for everybody, every human ever. And that desire was that every human in existence would know him, and really know how huge, high, and deep his love for us really is. And he planned every single moment, moving four different kingdoms over 600 years with care and beauty. Like, it's genius, too, like the way God set it up. So God, and this is my big point of today, God has done the prepping. The prep work's done. The road is paved. The way is there. If... God has done everything. You know, I, I, I kind of even just think today, like, how God has set up our world and neighborhoods, the fact that we have roads and, and we can drive these hunks of metal 75 miles per hour down them, um, which is just, uh, yeah, it is kind of fast. It is probably speeding. <laughs> but anyway, and, uh, and you, know, you know, sometimes I think, like, okay, oh, yeah, our roads have potholes, and it's like, man, I'll take a pothole over a pirate any day. Like, we have... <laughs> We have so much opportunity in our world today. And, and we live in a connected age. Like, we have uh, devices and cell phones and uh, social media, and, which present lots of other challenges. But how many more good things they actually can bring us? And God doesn't just prep the conditions right for us in our day. Uh -huh. He also preps the hearts. That from when someone's born, from the moment that their eyes open, God is preparing the way for every human, setting the times and places that they would come and actually know him. Making it perfect. Knowing exactly what they need. He moves and reveals himself in different ways, really to everybody, but he has the right time and the right place that just as Paul moved into Thessalonica to bring the message of Jesus, you know, full and um, uh, undiluted, he has that moment set for every person in their life for this. And, and I think it goes also to say, I should say something that there was also, with, you know, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you keep rat reading in Acts uh, 17, there was many Jews and Greeks that did believe. But then there was a bunch that didn't, and they started a mob and ran them out of town. That when you bring Jesus, like the full message to people, it's either going to be... Uh, you know, an amazing, awesome thing. Or as Paul writes, the stench of death. <laughs> like there's two different sides to it. It's either going to be the most amazing message someone hears or it's going to be uh, something they want to start a mob and run you out of town and send you to Berea. Uh, and so God sets these things up. It's, and these things blow me away. And, you know, I think about these students coming back for the school year. All 40,000 of them wondering. And, you know, I don't, I don't think even just wondering. I am certain that there are some that this moment, them being back at school, away from family, on their own, forming their own opinions, that God has said, this is the time. All there needs to be is a Paul to walk in, 
to have a conversation. You know, many of you know my story. Uh, I went to the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I grew up a religious person, my family. My dad was Catholic. My mom was uh, some kind of Baptist. I can explain it. It's a little complicated, but anyway. <laughs> Um, um, I grew up with God really my whole life. Um, I went to church, my family was very devout, we would we'd go to church on Sundays, we participate in Bible studies, all these things. Um, but growing up there was definitely like uh, uh, two-sidedness to my life. Uh, I was uh, just one person at church um, and the rest of my life I was really just a chameleon. Um, I just blended in wherever I was. I was at church on Sundays, on uh, the weekends I'd be with my, with my brothers doing really stupid things and uh, just, you know, living a life of folly and, and things like that. And anyway, um, growing up I always knew about God. I always loved God. It wasn't until I was a sophomore in college and, and really I started to consider, wow, my life is very different than what the Bible says. Like, I still love God and believe in Him and believe He works in mysterious ways, but I, it's very different than what the Bible actually says. Like, my life is, it was just very different. Um, and and my, my sophomore year at UC, I was, uh, I was still deciding a major. Um, I kind of had a, a time where I was like, well, man, I, I believe in God and I want to and all these things, but there is just something. And I couldn't hardly put it to words. And I just felt like, oh, I, but I don't know. And, and what God, every moment leading up to that, by the way, it's like God put people in my life that did love God. Like I got to see some pretty sweet examples of what a life of faith looked like or just the fruit of what listening to God's word said. But my sophomore year, I started reading these books. Um, I didn't know really, like I wasn't really an atheist, but I was like, man, this God, this doesn't sound right. I started reading books like uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, which I recommend. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and that was really the time in my life where I was like, hmm, it actually makes a lot of sense in <laughs> believing in God. If you have never read the book, recommend it. It's amazing. God put that book in my life because of my uncle um, who sent it my way, who at the time, I, I don't even know if he was a Christian or not. <laughs> I think he just sent it to me because of C.S. Lewis. Um, but anyway, it was this book that really got me first thinking like, wow, I, maybe God is real. And then I remember one night, it would have been in 2014, I was in my dorm and I was reading that book and I started tearing up and I was like, oh man, if God's real. So I prayed a prayer and I was like, if God's real, then you have the power to find me. Like, I can learn about who exactly you are and you can reveal that to me. If, if God is real, you have the power. So I prayed a prayer, God, if you're out there, come find me. Help me figure this out. I don't, I think I love you. I, th I think I'm in a relationship with you, but honestly, it's, there's this whole other side of me that I'm just not sure. And not even two weeks after that, I, I'm on campus and it's amazing that one with power of prayer that in the moment I prayed that, wow, God's plan really started to ramp up. I was on campus and I walk up and these two guys walk up to me and there's a tall gentleman named Chris who had honestly the biggest smile I've ever seen uh, as he walked up to a stranger and, uh, and he introduces himself and he honestly acts like we're best friends. I'm like, well, you're like really nice. Um, and, and then his buddy Aaron was there with a shorter white dude and he didn't say anything like the whole time. He's kind of stoic. And then at the very end, he's like, you should come to our Bible discussion. And, uh, and so they asked me this and I'm like, ah, yeah, you know, I got one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Peace. And I left. Um, and so two weeks, I think maybe a two weeks after that, um, then I end up walking home from the library with my roommate and he's like, Hey, some dudes asked me to come to this Bible thing. I don't want to go alone. Can you come with me? Um, so I go with them and lo and behold, it was Chris and Aaron, the same group. So it was kind of awkward walking in. Um, but I remember that night or that, that Bible discussion, it was different than anything I ever really experienced. Everyone there was friends. Like, I was like, whoa, like you guys actually like, like each other. Um, and everybody, I remember this, I don't remember what we, what we talked about, but I remember everybody had a Bible and everybody was taking notes. Um, I had never really experienced that. Um, I remember just like, wow, there's something very different. And through a series of events, I become great friends with Colin and Jason, these two other guys that were in that group. And these were just college dudes. Like, there was nothing special. They, they asked me to study the Bible. And what they showed me was really, like, they weren't these professional orators or anything. They were just these two dudes that, like, had the Bible and showed me it. And then showed, as, how is this, how is it applying this to your life? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't, don't think I've ever thought about that before. I had, my, had a Bible on my nightstand my whole life, but never actually let the words seep into my heart. 
and really consider them. And, and it wouldn't take long after that, 2015, I got baptized and I decided, hey, if I'm in, I'm in. If I'm a disciple, I'm going to be a disciple to the fullest extent. And, and that was my story. And, and God prepared every step of that from the book to my family to an understanding of him to then Chris and Aaron um, who uh, became great friends with both of them um, to then Jason and Colin. It's, and then these two guys just like Paul walked into the synagogue with uh, and he didn't have anything. He just the, the Bibles were there and they just reasoned with the scriptures. The world changed from that moment just because of that. And my world changed at that moment. And, and there's power in just conversation and asking someone to sit down and look at the Bible and just consider it. And I don't know about you guys, though. Like, I, I, when I share my faith and I tell people or ask them to study the Bible, like, I get like this nervous feeling in my belly. Like, I, I, I'm like, oh, what are they going to say? How are they going to respond? Like, I, there's power in conversation, but I also think very equally, there's power in an invitation. That bringing someone to church and, and inviting them out to see what the kingdom's like, that there is immense power in that. Uh, there should be a slide of a picture of a dude that's coming up behind me. There he is. Okay. That's uh, Dom Toretto um, from, no, I'm just joking. That's, uh, with him is Ellis. Uh, if you guys know Ellis, he was uh, the first student at Lehigh that when we planted the church, uh, made Jesus Lord. Um, now he's just a great friend. And, but I remember uh, even him, our first year, uh, how he got met was during one of our Wednesday campus evangelism nights. Uh, Tierra, I believe, and I think Jenny, uh, who's now down in, in Carolina with her husband, Val. Uh, they just walked up to Ellis and invited them to church. Um, I remember I was talking to Ellis this week and I was like, hey, were you like looking for God in any way? Like when you did that and when they asked you and he's like, you know what? No. <laughs> and, and it's funny because like Jesus says that some people are looking like looking for the treasure in the field and others just stumble upon it it's, um, and they stumble upon gold and Ellis is one of those people and there is just power in walking up to someone and saying hey you want to come to church on Sunday um, he came to church that Sunday I got to meet him Kirk got to meet him we set up a study and not too long after that uh, Ellis's life changed forever now Ellis is just a great friend and I was talking to someone who's in his ministry now he's out in California if you don't know um, and he was saying to me, dude, Ellis is indispensable in our ministry. Like, the impact this guy has. Uh, he says he's the kind of guy that will go on a on-the-whim uh, hike of a mountain with a visitor um, just to, to get to know him and, and to show him a good time, and, which he literally did uh, once. I think he just went, went and hiked the mountain with this dude. Uh, Ellis is not a hiker. And uh, anyway... Uh, all of that never would have happened if two people just didn't walk up and say, hey, want to come to church? Yeah. His whole life was changed. And, and kind of bringing in the sermon for, you know, landing, I want to end on this. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts 16, right before Paul and Silas uh, get to Thessalonica and take the um, Ignatian Way, which was the road that went through all these uh, cities, uh, it says... Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phygria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Then they came to the border of Mycenae, and they tried to enter Bithynia. So they, they went up, and, you know, the Spirit was stopping them from going here. And they kept going up, and they were going to come down. And then the Spirit of Jesus says, no, don't go there. And what happened is then they, they kept going west, or not west, yes, west. And... And then they end up on the grand way that took them to Apollonia and Thessalonica and then Berea. And that whole, the whole second missionary journey um, was started by the Holy Spirit guiding their steps not to go to Asia. Um, and I think to the, the end this is that I think we all got to remember that every step we take when we go out and share our faith, talk to people, we're stepping step and step with the Spirit. Like we, if you're a, a a repented, baptized Christian, you, you have God's Spirit living within you. Uh, not the Holy Spirit. I love the way even the, the verse puts it in Acts 16. The Spirit of Jesus is walking step and step with you wherever you are and guiding you. And, and I want to end with, uh, well, actually, I, there's one more, there's a quote up there um, that should come up by a guy named uh, J, J.K., I forgot I put this in there, uh, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, but the quote is, a man knocking at the door of a brothel is knocking for God. I love this quote. 
it's why, and what it kind of means is that uh, whether someone knows it or not, uh, whether they're intentionally seeking or stumbles upon something like Ellis, um, everybody's looking for something. Whether it's a uh, successful school, whether it's a really good career, security, relationship, maybe some people are going to college literally just because they want a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, or they're looking just for pleasure. Whatever it is, all these things, what people actually want is God. They're looking for God. That's all. That's what they need. They just don't know it yet. Uh, I definitely did not know it yet. And, and what I want to end on is we got to know what we're about. We, we have the spirit of Jesus living within us. Like everywhere we go, we are the most dangerous things there. Like it's God who's with us. And, and I want us, and I have one story a few weeks ago, well not a few weeks ago, like a week ago, my family from Ohio came to visit me. Um, and one night, uh, you know, I have a little sister who's 10 years old. She turned 10. Her birthday was that week. And she wanted to go to this restaurant called The Wooden Match. My, uh, my parent or my mom said that she could choose any restaurant she wanted. And if you go to The Wooden Matches like Google, uh, it says uh, bar and cigar house <laughs> on, on the Google. But she saw that it was pet friendly. And she was like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to go there. And she probably just thought she was going to be able to pet all the dogs that were maybe in there. And anyway, we go there. Music Fest is going on. The restaurant's closed down. Uh, but there's this little landing that walks up to the restaurant. We just walk there on foot. Um, and at the top of the landing, there was a bouncer. And there was nobody there yet. This was a, a safe environment for children, I promise. Uh, there was no one there yet. It was early in the day still. Uh, but at the landing, it said, must be 21 or older. And there was a bouncer just kind of standing there. And as we kind of walked up, and we were kind of seeing that there was nobody there, my little sister just ran on ahead up the stairs. Um, the bouncer was kind of seeing her as she was running up the stairs. And she just went straight by him. And <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even look. <laughs> then the bouncer looked at us and then looked at her. And then we walk up, we're like, oh, sorry, are you guys even open? He's like, nah, bro, we're not open. And so I want us this week, wherever you, <laughs> wherever you are, to, to walk up to people, whether you're at Rush Week or you're just at work or on the street or at the grocery store, to walk up to people with the same boldness and confidence of a 10-year-old girl on her birthday going to a cigar house. <laughs> Because it's pet friendly. <laughs> and, um, so, but the boldness of that, because the truth is, you, if you got the spirit, God's with you. Like, just go. Like, and he's prepped any, everything. He's already paved the way. Um, you just got to get stepping. <laughs> so then, God has...